And uh, the quicker we understand that, the quicker we can get into God's plan. As a matter of fact, God is so detailed, He has individual callings and plans for every single person because He knows every society, every need, every need in the city, and He knows the only way He can reach them is through His servants. That's who we are. And so uh, I celebrate the difference of the church, uh, but I also know what I'm called to. And I think um, part of the struggle of most believers is finding out where they're struggling, where they're calling is. Should I just turn this off and just use the handheld? I'm just wondering, should I? Or is this working? It's not coming through. It's coming through that. Test, test, one, two, three. Is that coming through? Yeah. It's not loud, but it's there. Oh, yes, it's right. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. So. How's that? Any better? Should I use the handheld? Okay, go with the handheld. It's been an executive decision. So I'm going to turn the mute on on this one. But, um, so being a, a church and an individual... Okay, this is, uh, this is really going off the rails now. <laughs> okay, it's turned off there. Okay, I just won't touch anything. <laughs> that was not part of my message. Just so you know. But... Uh, uh, so, you know, it's kind of getting into the place where, you know, it, it's understanding who you are and what God has called you to do. And uh, I kind of got this very early in life. Uh, I, I remember in 1982, there was a missions conference in Calgary. And some of you older folks might remember a guy by the name of Keith Green. Uh, Keith Green passed away and his wife came to Calgary and she put on a, a missions thing. And I remember all of the missions uh, countries were around the uh, Max Bell Arena, signs held up for different countries all the way around. And there was one sign held up with the name Calgary, in Calgary. And I thought, man, I wonder who's, who's going to go over to Calgary, a bunch of, you know, wimps. And this was at a time where I was saying to God, God, I'm willing to go anywhere you want me to go. And I remember I was there with my wife, Colette, and God spoke to me right there. He said, you're staying here. So I had to humbly walk over to the Calvary sign and look like a total coward on staying home at a missions conference. But you know what? It's important that you and I know what we're called to do and where God has called us. And as I say, there's a lot of different churches, and we are a unique church. So I'm going to be sharing a little bit about our history and what we've been through. And when I share, I don't want to challenge you to do what I do. But I want what I do to challenge you and what God has called you to do. Because that's what it's all about. And so, the sermon... Uh, the title is Nothing is Impossible with God. I was given that order to make that a title of the sermon, by the way, Pastor Nina said, this is what you're going to preach on. <laughs> but that's okay, because it fits right in. Because it's true. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. And, you know, a lot of times the only limitations that uh, we face are the limitations that we put on God, uh, that we put on ourselves. And so Mark 10, 27, you know, that's the, the theme of this uh, 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 celebration of three years, which is an awesome celebration. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Wow, it's easier to say than to believe. You know, sometimes you say, oh man, I believe that. You get to a service and it's exciting, but then you get to the trials and the reality of life and you're like, oh, wait a minute. How do I make this happen? And so I'm going to give you some uh, uh, four things this afternoon that are going to help you realize the impossibilities that God, uh, uh, that, that are, you're facing in the natural, that God is going to make possible in your life. 
And so the first one is identity. Identity. You know, when the disciples uh, in Acts, uh, Acts uh, 4.13, uh, they were being looked at by some people, some of the Pharisees and sometimes some of the, uh, just some of the people in the square. And it says in Acts 4.13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. Do you ever find whenever, you know, life gets you down, or there's ups and downs, or there's big challenges, how when you just spend time with Jesus, how all those things seem to melt away. There's something about being with Jesus that transforms us in the situation that we're in. If we look at a situation from our flesh, we will get fearful and scared every time. But if we spend time with Jesus, the person who we are becomes changed within the circumstance and we begin to see it differently and faith begins to rise up in us. And you know, it's faith that changes things. It's not the problem that you're facing, it's who, what kind of faith you have facing it. And you know, I'm, I've learned this early in ministry because when we first started out, uh, you know, and I remember in my uh, early car sales days, I was a salesman. I went to Bible college and then I said, God, what do you want me to do? And I said, you know, there's no room in ministry at the church I'm at. And uh, what do you want me to do? And God said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, Lord, I'd like to sell cars. And uh, he said, go for it. And I thought, okay. And I told all my friends, and they thought, you know, you're going to Bible college to car sales. Are you in Baxton? Or what's going on? But I went into car sales, and after about... I don't know, about six months, I was so depressed because I looked at my paycheck and it was $11. What a great salesman I was. And I brought my paycheck home to my wife, $11, and she was not happy. And then I started to complain to God. I said, God, $11, what's going on? I thought you said, go into car sales. I thought you said this. I thought you said that. And God spoke to me and he said, Don, that's a measure of your faith. Ooh. Now, money isn't the only measure of your faith, but it is one of them. It's not the only indicator, but it is one of the indicators. And I had to learn how to make money by faith. And so I went from being the worst car salesman in that dealership. And at five years, in the last two years, I was the number one salesman. Yeah. But you know what? If you bring God into your situation, no matter what it is, He will take you where you need to be. But it's a question of coming into the presence of Jesus, because when you come into the presence of Jesus, your identity changes into who he, he wants you to be. And He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be a blessing. And it was at that, that, that same dealership that I learned that I was making pretty good money, and I came to the realization and said, God, you know what? Uh, you know, I want to still be in ministry. I don't just want to make a whole bunch of money for myself. I want to make a whole bunch of money for the kingdom. And God said, you go over to ministry. And in 1992, we started with Victory Churches International. I got hired on as the outreach worker, and uh, we started a bus ministry, because I've always had a heart for the inner city. I've always had a heart for the poor in the city. And so it was a natural thing. And uh, we started to bus load uh, homeless people up to our Northwest Church in Calgary. And it was fun for the first three months. And then all of a sudden, purses started to go missing and all kinds of problems started to happen. And then there was a clash of classes. You've got the poor and the middle class. 
And we quickly found out that, you know, a lot of people that were coming to church, they wanted to bring their kids to a safe environment. And we were bringing up homeless on buses that half of them didn't even want to be in church. And they were scary looking. And so after a while, we roped off an area for the homeless, and it became us and them, and oh, what are we going to do? There was a clash of classes. And you might think, well, gee, you know what? We just needed to, you know, be more loving. But sometimes practicality, God wants us to learn some things through practicality so that we can do things better and minister to segments of society in a better way. And so what happened was, we started to pray about it. And we said, okay, we are a church planting organization. Why don't we plant a church for the poor? And you know what, this idea just came to us. And so that's exactly what we did. We said, let's just plant a church for the poor down in a poor neighborhood so that the poor feel comfortable. Now, it would have been all right if I would have brought one person to the Northwest Church, the middle class, and I was with them, and I looked after them, and I discipled them. But we were bringing a whole bunch of people. And so it was too chaotic. And so what happened was we started a downtown church in 1992 in the roughest neighborhood in the city. And uh, I love going to dark places. I love going to rough places. And we found this old beaten up church in Victoria Park. And uh, it was built in 1911 and it was falling apart. It was abandoned. And uh, we were driving. And when we saw it, we saw this is the right place. And so we uh, found out who owned it and we started renting that church. And we fixed it up. And after about uh, six weeks of fixing up, we had our first service. And I uh, remember the offering in the first 30 days was like $42. And this is going to be our church. And so that's when that's where we started. And in that church, we started to get to know the people in the neighborhood. And when I say identity, you know, I am not from the street. But I love God. And I love people. And a lot of people say when we started the church, they say, oh, you must be from the street yourself. I said, no, I'm from a middle class home. And they said, really? Yeah, I just love people. And you know, that never made sense to me because I think about God coming out of heaven down to us. But something tells me that God is more than middle class up in heaven. As a matter of fact, he's probably can't even relate sometimes with the level of which we live in. And yet, he broke down the barrier and came down and walked amongst us. There's no place that the love of God can't go. There's no place. And so we started down at Victoria Park, and I was great in my element. I felt like this is what God had called me to do. It was my identity. Uh, and you know what? A lot of you are gonna are on your way to getting there. And it didn't happen overnight, but I got there and I felt really good about being there. And I thought, well, my first thing I'm gonna do as a church, we wanna do an outreach in the neighborhood, so we should knock on some doors. Well, the house next to the church was the neighborhood drug house. And in it was the neighborhood drug dealer. And after we'd been there for about, I don't know, it was probably about two or three months or, or so, we got lots of flyers out in the neighborhood. And so the drug dealer, he knew who I was. And I knew who he was, and I'd see him on the street sometime, and I, I found out his name, his name was Jaron. And I'd say hi to him on the street, and he would thoroughly ignore me. And I, I just thought, well, man, that's a guy I want to get to know. And so I thought, well, my first uh, door knocking experience is going to be in the drug house next door. And down in Victoria Park in those days, they had old houses that they made into three or four apartments. And they converted them. And so they had three or four apartments in there. And Darren was on the main level. 
And so I went over there one day, and I remember asking a guy, which, which apartment is Darren in? And he said, you know, oh, he's in the first floor there. And he gave me a suspicious look, like I was a narc or something like that, or a policeman. And he scurried off. And so I went in, I knocked on the door, and I heard a voice on the other side saying, who is it? And I said, well, it's Pastor Don from next door. I just wanted to come over and, and pay you a visit. And he said, I'm busy. And I said, okay, well, I'll come back another time. And he just let it go, hopefully, that I can never come back. But I'm a bit tenacious. So anyway, about three weeks later, same again. I go over, I knock on the door, and I hear, who is it? I says, Pastor Don from next door. And silence. I'm busy. And I said, okay, well, let me know when you got time. I'm just coming next door. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I left. And you know, people would come and go into his apartment all the time because they're buying drugs. And I was thinking, how am I going to get in there without buying drugs? <laughs> And so anyway, another time I go over, and it was the same thing. I knock on the door. He says, I'm busy. And so I, by this time, I was getting a little bit discouraged. And so I went back to the church, and I remember it was just around Christmas, and we had an extra food hamper in the hamper room. And I thought, there might be my ticket in. There's one thing about drug dealers, they never have food. <laughs> And so I went over again, and same scenario, it's pastor on from next door, he says, I'm busy. And I said, I got a food hamper, and there was silence. And then the door opened, and there I was, face to face with the drug dealer in Victoria Park. And he looked at me, he looked at the hamper, he took the hamper, and then he slammed the door in my face. <laughs> But I could tell by the way he slammed the door that he was starting to soften. Seriously, he was starting to soften. And so anyway, I left that day, and I thought, okay, well, if that's the way he's going to be. I'm going to go back again. And I went back one more time, knocked on the door, and there was silence. There was a ruffle. The door opens, and he invites me in. A drug dealer invites me in. And so there I was, the first day, I was almost nervous because I didn't know what to say. I thought, man, you know, uh, I, I didn't expect them to let me in, so now I'm in, what do I say? And we were kind of awkward, you know? I mean, I'm a pastor, he's a drug dealer, what are you talking about? So anyway, just started to start with some small talk, and then of course we got around to talk about the Lord, and he was kind of evasive on that. Uh, but you know what? We've started to connect a little bit that first day. I think he was a bit curious about me being a pastor. And of course, I was curious about him and how he got into the drug life. And so we left that day, and there was many more meetings where I would well, be welcomed into his place because something broke that day. And he would invite me in. He was still continuing with his drug dealing doing all this stuff. I was continuing to pastor, but we had a connection. God connected us somehow in a way that we almost became like, well, we did, we became friends. And so I would say to him, say, Darren, you know, why did you get into this drug life? And he explained that he came from poor home, and you know, he said, uh, the only reason I'm in this drug life is because it's good money and it's easy money. And I said, well, how do you think God feels about what you're doing? And he says, you know what? I think God's all right with it. I've never ripped off anybody in a drug deal. That was it is, and I almost burst out laughing, but then I began to realize that's the world he lives in. And after a while, he would have me in, and sometimes I'd come in and the room was full of people. And they were all smoking dope up and around. And by this time, a lot of people knew who I was. And, and Darren, he would get a kick out of introducing me to all the people. Because they'd all kind of said, say, this is Pastor John from next door. And they're all like, you know. And I remember one time, 
they were in a big circle, and I kind of sat in the circle there, and was just kind of sharing, hey, you guys, are, uh, how you doing, all stuff, and they were passing the joint around, and they were speeding it up to get it around to me. And then the guy right next to me had the joint, was about to pass it to me, and he, everyone was silent. <laughs> And I said, no thanks. And the whole room burst into laughter. But you know something? There was a connection that started to happen there. And in that building, many people, there was something that broke in the atmosphere. Many people from the building started coming to church that lived in that apartment. Many people that were buying drugs from Darren would hear the stories of me, and they started coming to church. And you know, Darren never came to church. But he would always let me come in. He would always let me share. And I remember one time I was sharing the gospel with Darren, and he just sold drugs to some, a couple, and they went into the back room to shoot up the drugs. And they were eavesdropping on our conversation. And the Holy Spirit must have really hit him because when I left, they came up and said, who are you talking to, Derek? Because, oh, that was the pastor next door. The next day, that couple came and gave their hearts to the Lord in the church. And then there was others that lived upstairs. They started coming to church. Something broke in the atmosphere. And eventually, Darren got busted. And he went to jail. I went to visit him in jail. And still, he was kind of guarded on the subject of God. But he'd heard the gospel. And I'm just believing that he's going to be saved, even though that was a long time ago. I haven't seen him for a long time. And so that house, what happened was, uh, the, the landlord came to us as a church and they said, would you take this church house over? I'm tired of the drug addicts and the half, you know, they're not paying their rents, they're wrecking the place all the time. Would you take it over? And I said, yeah. And so we took that house over and it became one of the first houses that we renovated and it was for women. And we totally transformed it with about $40,000. And we, and it was interesting that we, the very room where I would just share with Darren became the weekly room where we had a Bible study for the neighborhood. And it was our women's house. And I remember one lady said once there was a guy that came to buy drugs, and she said, this isn't a drug house anymore, it's a Christian house. And the guy thought, what? Because he knew what it used to be like. And so we rented that house, and we started doing that in the neighborhood. We started finding houses that were derelict and uh, dilapidated, and one house at a time, we would talk to the owners and say if they could rent it to us cheap, and we would fix it up. And we had eventually had seven houses that we did. And so it just became our identity in the neighborhood. And it began to, sometimes your identity is often defined by the challenges you face or the needs that you face. And so when you come to those places, what happens is when you go to God, He gives you a solution that actually strengthens your identity in Him and gives you a confidence that He's going to come through supernaturally somehow. And He did. He came through in that house and we got that house and we transformed it and we did seven more houses. And so there was a boldness that raised up in our church to take that neighborhood and everybody knew who we were. And so identity, and you know, when I think of you guys as three years old in the Lord, I get so excited because this is a, a, a milestone. You know, and I think Pastor De 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 Dina said it, she didn't know she'd make it to this part. Many of you didn't know you're making this part, but you did. And you know what? You are a strong, healthy church with a strong, healthy, godly identity. And I am excited to see what's going to happen from here on out as you go forward. Because if this is what God has done in three years, this is quite incredible. It really is. And so I know these, yeah. 
So I know I'm the executive. We just want to pass on our 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 uh, our, our, our greetings. Uh, this is, church is really uh, becoming a strong church with a strong identity, and I'm excited for what God has for you. But that's going to be something that you're going to discover. And you know what happens? As you discover your identity as a church, you as individuals discover your identity too. And you know, when the Bible talks about the poor, and I'm in a street church that's in a whole bunch of middle class churches, you know, the Bible talks when it comes to the harvest of your land, leave the corners of the field for the poor. You know, translate that today, we have a whole bunch of industry and oil industry that should be leaving corners for the poor. And you know what? I've made it my business to find those corners and to make an avenue for those corners. And you guys have been active in sowing, giving a corner of your offerings to our new project at TNC, and I appreciate that so much. But you understand that principle. So thank you very much. And so identity is the first thing. Integrity is the second thing. You know, if you're gonna build, you've got to build on the word. You gotta know who you are, and then you gotta build on the word. You gotta build wisely. And you know, for us, that mentioned we had to understand that when Odana Victoria Park, as you know, we had a church after about three years, we became autonomous. Uh, our offerings were a little bit better than $43, and so we were able to get up a little bit. But a street church brings in about half the tithes and offerings as a mainline church at best. And so we were downtown and we had, uh, 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 you know, a minimal amount of money, just enough to pay for the pastor. And uh, uh, that was me. And so that was, uh, that was good. Uh, but then we had a whole bunch of social aspects of what we did. And the social aspects was way too much money for us. So what we did is we restructured it. And in 1995, I started what was called the Victory Foundation. And this was a society made up of a board that was a businessman and people that I've known for a number of years. And they came on that board and it was separate from the church. And what they did was they made, took care of all the social aspects of what we do. And then the church just continued as a church does. And as a result of that, we were able to renovate houses and begin to build a, 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 a model that we are using today that has been so successful. God has really blessed it. But you know what? It meant that I had to, if I was going to reach the poor, I had to bring in the rich to meet the poor. And I had to get the poor committed long enough to get stable, and I had to get the rich committed long enough uh, to be able to help, to bring stability. And so our ministry was built on the faith of the poor and the humility of the affluent. And that's the model that we've used, and we got that right out of James. Because James says the poor are very rich in faith. Very rich in faith. And he says to the affluent, you guys need to be humble. Right? Move in humility. And I found that so, to be so true. And one of the ways that uh, the faith of the poor, I wanted to give you an example. Our church in Victoria Park was on a corner. The drug house was on this side. And then on the other side was an old beat up house that looked like it was abandoned. As a matter of fact, when I first got there, I thought it was abandoned. And then after about three weeks, I seen this old guy come out of this house. And he creeped, kind of shuffled along. He was like 60 years old, but he looked like he was 80 because he had such a rough life. He was an alcoholic. And so I introduced myself to him, and his name was Lloyd. And I thought, man, what? I didn't know anybody lived here. He goes, oh yeah, I've lived here for 20 years. His wife had died, he was all alone. 
And so I started offering him rides to go pay his bills and stuff. And at first he was kind of, you know, a little bit leery of me because I was the pastor next door. And uh, so anyway, after a while, he says, she came to me, he says, you know, would you still be willing to offer me that ride? And I said, sure. And so off we went and I got to know Lloyd in conversation, how he was brought up. And he said when he was a kid, he went to Sunday school. But he said that was a long time ago. And, you know, Lloyd was about five foot six and he had really blue eyes. And he had a big elbow where he had gout hanging out on his elbow. And, and he was the kind of guy that was very rough looking. He was the kind of guy you could smell him before you see him. And, uh, but he had a, just a kind of something about him I liked, even though he was a kind of a rough character. And so anyway, as I got to know Lloyd, I began to help him more. And he started coming to church. And I remember we had an outreach one night, and the first guy that night to come down and give his heart to the Lord was Lloyd next door to the house. I'll tell you, the whole church by that time, because the whole church was praying for him by that time. And so Lloyd came to church, and he got saved, and he started coming uh, regularly. But what he and I started doing was doing a Bible study every Tuesday. And I go over to his house and we read the word together. And we did this for many, many years. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I got a little bit judgmental because I thought, Lord, you know, we've been doing a Bible study here, me and Lloyd, and he's still drinking. He struggled with alcohol. He drank all his life. He drank at the Regis. He had his drinking buddies. And so, but he wasn't drunk all the time, but I just knew he had a struggle. He admitted he had a, a struggle with alcohol and he just couldn't beat it. And it was really difficult because every once in a while, he would call up, dial a bottle. You dial up a bottle and the guy would deliver. And uh, it was right outside my window as a pastor. I could look and I could watch, you know. And so Lloyd, he didn't like that too much, you know, kind of too much accountability, you know. And so anyway, he struggled and I said, Lord, here I am doing a Bible study. He's not changing fast enough. You ever have people in your life who just think they're not changing fast enough? Have you ever complained to God? Don't. I complain to God. Well, you can complain to God. You'll probably end up the same place. I said, God, he's not changing fast enough. Maybe I should move on to better soil, Lord. I said that to him. And God spoke to my heart and said, loneliness is good soil. Lloyd is lonely and he wants his fellowship. And he has fellowship with me when he has fellowship with you. And you know what? I changed my whole perspective. And I just began to love Lloyd where he was at. Not looking for results. And yes, we want to challenge each other. And he always was admitted that he had a drinking problem. But I just had to love him. God wanted to change me more than he wanted to change Lloyd. And sometimes that's the way it works. And so anyway, Lloyd and I would meet and he'd have it ups and downs and he was never consistent. But I knew he had a love for the word. He really did. He loved the reading the word. We would go through Romans and this and that. And then one day I went over and Lloyd, I found him dead in his kitchen. He just died. This was after about 10 years. He was about 59 years old because he had a rough, rough life. But two years before he died, Lloyd came into some money. He came into $15,000. Now, that's not a lot of money, maybe to some of us. It is to me, but it's not to some. But to Lloyd, it was like winning the lottery. He never had that much money at once in his whole life. $15,000. And so he came over to me 
And he said, Pastor John, uh, they made a mistake on my my CPP or whatever it was. And, it's, uh, and he says, they're going to give me a check for $15,000. I said, well, great, Lloyd. What are you going to do with it? He says, I'm going to go on a bender. Now, he'd say that to me because he knew he liked I would, how I would respond, but he was joking. He says, I'm going to go on a big drunk. And uh, he would joke with me that way. I said, Lloyd, you're not going to do that. And he goes, no, I'm not. He says, what I want to do, I've decided in my heart that I want to will this money to the church when I die. And I said, wow. And I'll be honest with you, because his life was always a little inconsistent, I thought, probably won't see that 15,000. Because he still drinks a lot. And he still goes to the St. Regis. So anyway, as I say, two years passed, and he made me the executor of his will. And after two years, I looked in the bank account, and there was $15,100 in his bank account. In the face of his addiction, in the face of his need, he kept his commitment to God. And I thought, man, you know, here's a guy, and when he got the money, I said, Lloyd, why don't you move out of this place and get a new place? He goes, no, I like it here. And I said, okay, well, why don't you use the money to fix it up? No, he says, it's not worth it. And I thought, okay. And, you know, I know he kept going to the St. Regis with his buddies, and his buddies knew they, that he had 15000 and they were always trying to get him to spend it. At his funeral, one of his buddies came to me and said sometimes he would dip into that 15000 but then he would go and park cars for Stampede, minus 20, to make sure he talked it up so that he could maintain his commitment. And I thought, man, here I was, looking for some kind of fruit from this guy's life. And missing the change that was going on on the inside. You know, God speaks to everybody. And we took that 15,000 and we made it the cornerstone of our housing project that we were about to find. Because we knew we wanted to get uh, our own housing project, buy a house, whatever it might be. And Lloyd's was the first 15,000 of our, the cornerstone of what we have for housing today. And you know, we began to raise funds because our first building that we were gonna buy was the Ailiff Lodge or the old Ogden Hotel. And it was two and a half million dollars to buy it. And Lloyd's was the first 15,000 in there. Well, when I started sharing the story, God just amplified the story and he brought in the affluent. And out of that two and a half million, we were fully paid in two years. We didn't owe anything on that hotel. And then, yeah. and then on top of that, we did a $3 million renovation and that was paid for in full. So God is so faithful. The faith of the poor, and oftentimes when it comes to the place of faith, it's not about what we have in our hands so much, but it's how we uh, 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 commit it to the Lord. If we commit to the Lord what we have in our hand by faith, He will multiply it. It's that commitment. God looks for our faith. It's like the widow with two mites. Got the attention of God. Lloyd got the attention of God. And what a privilege it was for me to know Lloyd, even though it was only for 10 years. He impacted my life. He was so forward, looking forward to starting, I can't remember which book it was in the Bible. And I remember thinking, well, he got to meet the author. So he's okay. And so when you build, you've got to build with integrity. And that means treating people's faith with integrity and their faith gifts with integrity. And when you do that, God opens up the doors. And you know, it was probably around 2013. Uh, we were in Victoria Park for 15 years as a church. And after 13 years, we started to see the stampede expand and they started bulldozing houses after houses. I think I saw 35 houses get bulldozed, bulldozed in a three month period. 
And it was at that time where we were really struggling, looking for a place to survive. And God spoke to my heart and said, I want you to plant a church. And I said, God, have you seen what's going on around here? We're, you know, we're losing our neighborhood. We've got no place to go. We're renting facilities. We can't afford anything. And God says, you plant a church. And so that's what we did. I thought, well, we're going to go up to Forest Lawn. And uh, that's where I felt God wanted us to go. And so in 2004, I think it was, we went up to Forest Lawn with uh, uh, just a few members. And we started having a Bible study in the Town and Country Hotel back in 2004. And you know, the Town and Country Hotel was a rough place. And uh, we'd meet every Saturday morning in the caf cafe. And on the one side of the cafe was a strip joint. And on the other side of the cafe was a VLT bar. So you really had to walk the narrow road if you went to this Bible study. And so we were meeting there for about a year. And then after a year, uh, Pastor Pat, one of my associates, we just felt she was the one. She took that group and uh, about, we had about 20 25 people that we sowed into that church and it started to grow and we were still down at Victoria Park and that's when we after two years we moved over to the uh, Ogden Hotel and we bought that and God started open up and God started expanding and I remember thinking at the time saying man God you are so good and by this time, I think after about two or two years that Forest Lawn was going, they were growing so much that they started in the basement of Pastor Pat's house. They grew to 50, then they went to the Community Association, they grew to 100, and then they needed a bigger building. And I remember opening up the real estate website that I always go to, and there was a church advertised in Calgary. And they didn't put the address. And I knew right away, it has to be in Forest Lawn. That's the only reason they wouldn't put the address, was because it was in Forest Lawn. Because if they put the address that's in Forest Lawn, no one's going to want to buy it. But I thought, man, that's the church I want to buy. So I put in an offer. I didn't have any money, but I put in an offer. And I told Pastor Pat, I said, we just put an offering on that church in Forest Lawn. And she was so excited. I said, but you need to go to the congregation and take up an offering. Because it's $1.6 million. And she said, uh, okay. And so she went to the congregation. She told them about the church. And they got so excited. And they took an offering. And in the offering, guess how much came in? $700. $700 for $1.6 million. And the realtors called me up. So, you gonna, I got other people interested in this building. Are you sure you're going to buy it? I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to buy it. And so, in the next three months, from outside donors, $900,000 came in. Again, the faith of the poor and the affluent of uh, the humility of the affluent. You know, people heard that story of the church just kind of giving 700 bucks for 1.6 million and it something stirred their hearts and these millionaires came in and they said, we're going to help you pay for this. And we did get a mortgage on that, but we were able to afford it because it was... Uh, a mortgage, but we were able to get the church, and now today that church is paid off. God's so good. God's so good. And so you know what? Integrity. God wants us to move in integrity. The next point is invincible. You know what? If you're in God's plan, no one will be able to stand in your way. Nobody. Nothing will stop it. You're invincible. You really are invincible in God. Now, it's got to be His timing. It may not happen when you think it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And so, you know, that means sometimes that uh, you've got to have a faith that's always forward. 
A lot of times I come up to roadblocks and I say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do when I got, you know, no money and $1.6 million. So I pray and I say, God, I'm praying forward. Somewhere, somehow, there's going to be a little bit of an encouragement. Someone's going to keep me going. And you know what? It's like going around a, a curve. The further you go around, the more you see. And then you see more and more. And then God brings in the people. But you've got to stay in faith and you've got to pray forward. Because we always face obstacles. A lot of times when we face obstacles, they say, oh, can't be done. Can't be done. And there's always going to be people that say, can't be done in your life. And that's okay. Because in the reality, it can't be done. What's the title of this sermon? Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Well, in order for nothing to be impossible, it has to be impossible. So in the natural, when people say, you can't get done, I say, praise God. Okay. Now I know God's in it. And so I just humbly say, you know what? You might be right. But I'm willing to be wrong, and I'm going to keep moving ahead in faith. I don't get all prideful and say, yeah, no, you're wrong. God said it. I'm claiming it. That's it. I've done that before, and I shot myself in the foot. Humility is something that we need to walk in when we're talking about faith. And you say, yeah, you're right. In the natural, it does look impossible. And maybe it won't happen, but I got a feeling. Uh oh, what's happening here? Okay, that's right. The spaceship just went over here. <laughs> so we've got to endure. Paul said, fight the good fight. F fight the good fight of faith. Of faith. Second Timothy 4 7 says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And so, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, with us, it's been a, been a challenge to kind of say, okay, God, uh, uh, we always have way more need than we do have uh, resources, but God always comes through. Because, you know, what we feed over, uh, give up over 200,000 meals a year through our two locations. And, you know, we have all of this housing, uh, but you know what? We just keep meeting the needs, and God keeps supplying. Uh, but you have to almost measure it to your faith and say, okay, God, I don't want to overextend ourselves, uh, uh, but we don't want to lag behind either. Uh, you know, when Jesus says he wants to put you in the yoke, that means you don't want to go too far ahead. You don't want to be too far behind. You want to be right where God wants you to be. Somebody said this, there's a book out there, that Jesus walks at three miles an hour. Just like the rest of us. And so don't try and get ahead, don't try and get behind, and just trust the Lord that he is building you and making you invincible. But that invincibility is when you're in the presence of God. You're exactly where he wants you to be. Doing what he wants you to do with the people that he wants you to be with. And, you know, I just really sense in this church, there is a unity that God is building in this church. He's knitting you together with the people that you're supposed to be with. And it's sharpening your gifts. It's sharpening you. And you know what? You are all going to be released into the calling that's going to be progressing to this church. But also, uh, your own calling is going to be more divine. Whether it's in the business world, whether it's on the mission field, whether it's in the church, wherever it might be, you've got to know that God is doing it right now. And it's going to happen, and it's going to be glorious. And it's exciting. I'll tell you, there's nothing more exciting than hope for God. And so we had to step out, and we stepped out, and we did that church plant. And so I want to finish up here because I thought, oh my goodness, how long have I spoken about this? Oh man, okay, well, I better get fed because I'm hungry. You know, I, I don't just, we don't just give out meals. We eat too much is why I know that. Okay. So lastly, there's increase. Increase is always something that God does. And you can see after three years, you guys have increased. You've got a healthy congregation. And increase can be in so many ways. It can be in maturity. It can be in giving. It can be numerically. It can be in all kinds of ways. I know for us, we started downtown with just a handful of people. And now we're reaching a thousand people a week through 
all of our outreach ministries. And so, you know what? The more people you can reach, the more people you can teach. And that's our philosophy. And so, you know, when we were in Victoria Park, uh, we kind of grew as, uh, and outgrew that, and then we moved to Forest Lawn, and then we moved to Ogden, and we bought the hotel, we have a church there, and now we're in uh, Forest Lawn. Uh, the church that we bought has been, uh, uh, it's redlining, it's, uh, the church is too big for that building, and so now we put an offer in to buy the Town and Country Hotel, and I got a picture of it here. This is what it looks like. That's the before. Actually, that's what it looks like right now. Now, this building is the most notorious hotel in Forest Lawn. Everybody knows about this place. I mean, I talk to people all the time. Some guys say, oh, yeah, that's where I first got drunk. Oh, that's where I first got stabbed. Anybody here ever been to the TNC? Good. You were good. Good. And anyone, you know, you probably want a minute. But anyway, it was a rough hotel. And so when I started going after this hotel, the owners, they wouldn't even return my call. This was about 10 years ago. I started calling them. I said, hey, do you want to sell this place? You know, and uh, of course they knew we wanted to buy it. They just ignored us, ignored us, ignored us, ignored us. And finally, after about three years, he starts returning my calls. And then God started to work on them. They thought that they were invincible. They thought that they would never let go of this hotel. But God started working on their hearts. And I kept talking to them and their business got worse and worse and worse. They had to close down the strip joint. You know, and, well, it didn't help that Pastor Pat uh, snuck in there and anointed the strip pole with oil. She did that, she went and she prayed over it. Uh, we, when we first got there, we prayed around the hotel and we claimed it and all this stuff. And, uh, well, they didn't have a chance. That's just basically it. They didn't have a chance. At it. So their business got so bad that in 2020, I think it was 2020, November, December, they finally said, we're willing to sell to you guys. And I thought, praise the Lord. And so they wanted $4 million. And my board member, there's always a board member that asks these questions. He said, how much money do we have in the building fund? And I said, um, $9,000. And he says, and how much do they want for the building? I said, $4 million. How much is it going to cost to renovate it all together with the building? That's going to be a total of $11 million. And we have $9,000 in the bank account. I mean, you know, fire this executive director. He's crazy. <laughs> but you know, they weren't that bad because they'd already been with me all these years and they know how God works. And so we signed the deal in November 2020. And they said, you know, you've got this much time to purchase the building. By July, we'd raised $4 million to buy the building. And so we owned the building. God just brought it in. And you know what? He did the same thing again. Only this time it was a little bit different. Some of the big donors, they came through. And I can tell you that Back 25, 30 years ago, we started in Victoria Park. There, I'll give you one example. There was one individual, he would come every Christmas and he put an offering in the offering bucket. It was $2,500. Now, back then, that was huge for us. And then I remember it went up to 5,000 after about five years. And when we bought the manor, he put in 100,000. The same guy. And then just recently he put in another two hundred thousand into one of our houses. Another guy who I led to the Lord, he's got his own business, he would give faithfully maybe a hundred uh, a thousand was the most he ever gave. For this project he gave a million dollars. 
And I said, damn. I said, if I'd have known you were that rich, I would have been nicer to you. <laughs> but you know what? When the Bible says he's going to give do a hundredfold for you, where you are today, what you give today, I can guarantee you will be a hundredfold that you're giving in the years to come. The guys that were giving 10,000 are giving 100,000 today in our ministry. Those that are gave 100,000 are giving a million and some beyond that. It's just the principle of God, but it's relationship and it's vision. You know what? Vision is only realized through people. You can have all the vision in the world, but if you don't have it realized through relationships with people where they can get their hands on it and become a part of it, and it's got to be the vision of God. And this TNC is the vision of God. And people are partnering. But you know what really touched my heart was when we got a check for $100 for the TNC. And I looked at the address of this check. Half a block down the road, it's called the Oasis Trailer Park. And it is anything but an oasis, let me tell you. It is the roughest trailer park you've ever seen. I mean, I've driven through there a couple of times and it's like, wow, this is rough. And one of the individuals in there, he pulled up in the parking lot one day and he said, you know what, I'm mad at you. And I said, why? He said, you took away my VLT bar. <laughs> but he was kind of, but you know, he was a senior and he would often go over to East Side to get meals. And he heard about what we were doing, that we we're going to take over the TNC and make it affordable housing for women, women with children and seniors, 40 rooms. And so when he heard that, he wrote a check for a hundred bucks. And if, I, if you could see where he lived, you'd think, this guy needs the money. I'll tell you, that's what moves the heart of God. The humility uh, of the affluent, but it's the faith of the poor. And you know what? This building is the talk of Forest Lawn because uh, everybody's talking about the old TNC, and now it's going to be turned into a church and affordable housing. And so we're going to have a church in there that's going to be double the size, more than double the size of the church we have now, so we can move the church in there. And we're going to still probably keep our building where we do all of our food services and whatnot. But God. God is on the move and so the church this is what it's going to look like when we're finished it's going to be nice yeah and it's going to have a, it's going to have a church in it that seats about 400 people it's going to have retail on the main level so it's going to have businesses in there and those businesses the reason why we need them is because uh, they are going to offset the rents to make them affordable and you know what? We don't get any government money for operations. We're not against it. We just don't seem to be able to get it. So we also believe that we want to be self-sufficient. Because the people that we bring in off the street and put into our houses in, in Ogden and here, we want them to be self-sufficient. So if we want them to be self-sufficient, we need to be self-sufficient. And we don't want to be totally reliant on the government. Now, it doesn't mean we don't ask for government money for capital, but we want the capital going to the building so that we can make it work and become self-sufficient. And so that's what we're working towards. And God has been so good. And I know, I, I can't help it, but whenever I get in front of people, you know, I just got to tell them what God has done. And so, but as I said earlier, I want you not to do what I do. But I want you to be inspired to do what God wants you to do and use me as an example. But having said that, in every church, there's always those that feel called to social ministry. I really believe that. And you know, and I think we, uh, specifically, that's my anointing. 
And some of you here, you might be feel called to a kind of a social ministry. I know I was. And when I felt called to the social ministry, I felt a little bit of a different stream from all of my contemporaries. But I'm here because I really believe that God wants to uh, uh, just uh, fire up that calling on your life. Whether it's to go for missions, overseas, or missions at home. There's home missions, and there's overseas missions. Or maybe it's just a call to work for people that are disadvantaged, or handicapped, or whatever it might be. Some kind of social ministry. I believe that God wants to impart that and stir that gift up into you. So what I want us to do is just, I'd like us all just to bow our heads. Because we're going to eat here soon. I promise. And um, if you feel called to social ministry, I just want you to raise your hand. Some kind of social ministry. Anybody? Just raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, there's one. Yeah, there's one. It may not be exactly what I do, but it might be something God's put on you. And so, okay, I'm just going to pray for you right now. I just want to pray for an impartation. Father, I just come before you right now. Lord God, I thank you that your word says that we're supposed to leave corners for the poor. That you hear the cries of the poor. And the way you answer those cries is to put it in the heart of, of people to rise up and be led to the social areas, the dark corners of our uh, society, Lord God, to bring your light. And I just pray, Father God, that you would stir up that gift and clarify that calling on those individuals that have their hands up here. And Father God, we want to make an avenue even for them, Lord God, uh, where they can speak to me, Lord, or they can come and volunteer at East Side, Lord God, through the week, or whatever it might be, Lord, so that, Father, they can be released in their calling. And I thank you, Lord God, that it will not only be a release, but it will be a release for this church where they will actively be, be pursuing leaving corners for the poor however that looks for this church Lord you call this church in a special calling and Lord God the strength of that calling is able uh, to leave corners for the poor uh, it doesn't mean you call them all to the poor but it means some of them are able to do that and they facilitate it in Jesus name and everyone said amen amen well, thank you very much we're going to eat food